All right, good morning. If you will stand with me uh, and open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 through 23. And as you turn there, be reminded that this is God's Word. It is inerrant. There are no errors in it. It is divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. And it is the only final authority in all that we are supposed to believe and do. So be addressed by God as you hear these words from Matthew 17, starting in verse 14. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your Son and the power of his word that commands all the forces of nature and even those evil spirits, all are powerless before his creative word. And so we thank you for this and we pray for your help and illumination by your Holy Spirit. Help us to understand what this means and help us to apply it to our lives today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. The uh, title here is Faithless and Twisted Generation, and I choose that on purpose because I think it's the interpretive key to the passage. It's going right back to that expression and that idea of this generation. It comes throughout Matthew's gospel, but here it comes with an additional condemnation, faithless and twisted generation. Uh, If this passage was just about one desperate man and seeking Jesus and about his son, namely the man's son, the sort of person that Jesus has always had compassion for. You see that throughout. And then you see, in this instance, he heals him just like always. It's instant just like always. Jesus has all power just like always. But there's before it and after it, almost like the boy and his father fade into the background. That they are like all other miracles that Jesus performs a sign. By now, it shouldn't be a mystery, these, these words that Jesus adds to it. It would be a mystery for us otherwise if we didn't have any other background in Matthew's gospel. And we see this and you say, well, usually Jesus is a lot more patient and compassionate. And, and he just, it almost like it's like uh, the disciples can't get it done. And then so he, it's almost like he, he, he sighs and almost rolls his eyes. Almost just like, boom. And then he heals him right away to show his power. And of course, that's in view, his power and his uniqueness are in view. But there's something else going on here. Matthew has been building this emphasis, this judgment of Christ on Jerusalem in every passage in one way or another. Now, if you look at Mark's gospel in chapter 9, there the emphasis in this account is more on the internal struggle of the man and his son. The confession, the famous confession of that man, it draws it out more. I believe, he says, help me in my unbelief. And that's a good prayer. That's, that's where a lot of us are. And then about the difficulty of the kind of demon possession that the boy was under. That, that's more in view, the internal aspect, the personal aspect in Mark's gospel. But in Matthew, the emphasis is external, on the time and the place, which time and place is symbolized by a mountain. Because Jerusalem was often referred to as the mountain of the Lord or Mount Zion, being situated on an elevated place. 
Mountains were also the meeting place between God and man. That was the case for Moses, famously, in Exodus. Likewise, Paul, in Galatians 4, he makes the allegory of the two women, Sarah and Hagar, who were real historical figures in Genesis 16. But Paul draws out of them, in addition, an allegory. He compares them to two covenants, really two ways of relating to God. And in the midst of that, he says that they are two mountains. Uh, he says Mount Sinai in Arabia, this is Galatians 4.25, which corresponds to the present Jerusalem. And then he contrasts that with the heavenly Mount Zion, or in other words, the Jerusalem above. So even Paul is saying, following Matthew's lead here, that Jerusalem is no longer Jerusalem in a sense. It's become more like, at least in this sense, more like Mount Sinai, where God relates to his people that way. And that's some interesting deep stuff there. But so it is here that Jesus took three of his own to a foretaste up on the mountain, a foretaste of the Jerusalem above. And now he descends to the one below. And this will be important because of the other way that mountain is used later on in the passage. So just two points to make it very clear. We have the great physician coming down to this real person that he has compassion for. We'll see a diagnosis and we'll see a cure. First, we'll see that the diagnosis is the spirit of this age. And second, the cure is God's power beyond this age. Now, that's very 101. That's very simple in a sense. But the big idea, the doctrine that we're going to get out of this passage today, is that only Christ's power from before all ages can drive out the spirit of a faithless and twisted generation. This boy has in him more than simply a problem to his physical body, though it highlights those details. But what is the nature of such a generation? He isn't talking about some garden variety paganism here. I mean, we're not told in the passage whether this boy is Jewish or not. Jesus was with a lot of Gentiles up in this region, but he had come back here to the area of Galilee, and there were still Greeks there, but now he was coming back to a little bit more of a Jewish area. So this is not just a pagan problem here. In fact, Matthew's going to highlight that it's the opposite of that. So let's get to the diagnosis. The diagnosis is the spirit of the age. Now, as I said, this is an individual. This is a real flesh and blood person. This is somebody that was loved by his father. This is somebody who Jesus had real compassion as a human being for. But that doesn't really show in Matthew's account of it. So why all the talk about the spirit of this age? Why talk in the big picture when this just looks at first like Jesus is coming down to the human level and being personal again? And the answer is, at least my first answer is, because Jesus does. What's his reaction to the man's words in verse 16? The man said, I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And you need to think hard about every word of Jesus' answer. It seems to not even address the man at all. Jesus answered, O oh, faithless and twisted generation. You can imagine him sort of lifting up his head and talking also to the crowds there. O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. Now again, one easy way to, to read this whole passage is to conclude that all Jesus is doing here is he is pointing to himself. Of course, no mere man, not even my disciples, ultimately can restore your son. Only I can do that. And that's true. That is on center stage here. But it doesn't really explain Jesus' exasperation. It doesn't really explain Jesus' words in the rest of the passage that seem to bring blame and which seemed to include, in a sense, both the crowds and the disciples among those whose faith was in some way insufficient. Calvin stresses here that, quote, the indignation of Christ was directed against the malice of the scribes, which I agree with as, so, as far as, the, as, far as the, the indignation goes. I'm not saying that he was mad at the disciples, but he, he's got a, a mixed crowd here. But what about the whole rebuke? He doesn't say, oh, faithless and twisted generation and my disciples too, I'll, I'll, I'll get to you later. He doesn't exclude them because the charge of the crowd was clearly against the disciples. They failed in some way. And of course, in some way they do fail and they ask him later, well, what's up here? But he simply lumps them all together this time to the spirit of the age. And we'll see that when he answers them privately. 
But as this demon embodied this boy, so this boy's condition embodies a generation. That's the connection. Jesus is not changing the subject. He's not taking the opportunity to ignore the boy and his father and address the crowds. And then he gets back to him later, kind of just boop. While he's at it addressing them, he'll just sort of on the side heal him. No, he makes this driving out of this demon emblematic of his driving out something else, which we will see more and more of. But being under such a spell, this boy is a danger to himself. It says here in verse 15, he has seizures. He suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. The picture is painted there that we would have pity on him. And in our own modern spirit of the age, we, we can't get our heads around both. The idea of bringing blame out of one side of our mouth and having pity in the same sentence. But why is the boy in a pitiable condition? You know, we, we read in the, in the assurance of pardon passage in, in Hebrews 2 that part of the gospel is that Jesus defeated the one who had the power of death, that is the devil. Because we had this fear through lifelong slavery, the devil had something on us, and Christ's work did something to that which matters most, that which was is the main slavery, the main bondage to the devil. All of this, as bad as it may seem, falling into fires, falling into water, are symptom level compared to the main problem. So why is the boy in this pitiable condition? And here I'm not asking how the demon got in him to begin with. The text doesn't give us that information. But in general, demons don't just inhabit temples that God dwells in. We know that from the rest of Scripture. It's one of the main reasons why you don't see Jesus casting demons out of someone who is his. You don't see that anywhere else in the New Testament. You don't see any instructions of what to do if a Christian becomes possessed. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit in us. And so the devil cannot inhabit that place where the Holy Spirit is. So why this person? Why this person in the middle of this lesson? Well, you might think back to the threat in the second commandment. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, you have attached to that commandment the threat that God would be visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me. And if you're wondering, no, I'm not picking on the father immediately here of the son. There's a bigger picture in view. As Jesus was returning to Jewish country in Galilee, when people as a whole turn their back on God, when they will not have Christ as Lord over every single thing in their lives and everything around them, they open the door of demons to many. And to get right to the point, when a people that have been outwardly God's people as Israel was will not have Christ as Lord of all, they open themselves up to a much more deep-rooted, rebellious pack of demons. And that principle doesn't go away in A.D. 70. You know, speaking of Mark's gospel, one of the sort of famous sermons to us, and I say us, those of us who came to Reformed theology through the, the gateway of the new Calvinism uh, in the first 10 years of this millennium, one of, the most, uh, one of the most widely listened to sermons was one at a Desiring God conference that Tim Keller preached, in which Keller sort of channeled back to Martin Lloyd-Jones. Now, Martin Lloyd-Jones was a Calvinist preacher in the 20th century, one of the great preachers of the 20th century, who was also a real medical doctor. They called him the doctor sometimes because of that. And Lloyd-Jones would naturally, as a medical doctor before he became a preacher, would use medical imagery. Of course, you would draw back on that. And he preached from this passage, and that's what Keller was pointing back to. Lloyd-Jones preached from that passage in Mark's gospel, and he used the analogy of an inoculation, that the whole purpose of an inoculation is to give you just enough of the disease to keep you from getting the real thing. Now, Keller applied that to um, what he called the Christ-haunted culture. I brought that phrase up earlier in this gospel. A people group, such as in America or in Western Europe, who had been called Christian, who had a Christian consensus or a Christian culture or whatever else. And oftentimes, and you know this from experience, is that oftentimes the most hardened atheists can be people that grew up in Christian homes. My experience in Idaho was that some of the hardest people to talk to were ex-Mormons. And that wasn't even Christian, it was a cult. But the idea there, and the imagery that Lloyd-Jones used and that Keller borrowed from, 
was this expression that Mark's gospel was teaching us, that the demon was in too deep. And that was an expression that they used over and over again. The question that the disciples asked, which I will get to, is partly answered by this kind. This kind of spirit takes prayer and fasting. And there's issues about the translation in Matthew's version of that. But it's, it's clearly said in Mark's version. That there, there's sort of a kind of spirit of the age that leaves you more hardened. Do you see that in the warning passages of Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10? That there's a kind of person in a kind of culture that is all the more difficult to reach, that is all the more beyond God's saving grace. Now, God can do whatever he wants, but there is a warning in these passages of Scripture that there is a kind of demon that is in too deep. And that's not just about Israel and the Jews in AD 70. If it was, why is it in the Bible for us? What do we take from it? Now, Jesus uses two words here to describe the spirit of the age. The first word, unbelieving, ah, pistos. Pistos is the word for belief or faith, and so ah just means non. So that's straightforward, unbelieving. This is, an, this is a spirit of unbelieving. That's straightforward. But the second word can be rendered perverse, or as it is in the ESV, twisted or distorted, or corrupt. And the idea being here of something that has become something other than what it was designed to be. Something which in the original was pure and good. And in fact, it's become opposite. It's become a tragic aberration of what it was meant to be. And so the boy couldn't even function as a human being. You might recall the description of the people of Nineveh at the end of Jonah, when we were in the Jonah series, in the very last words of chapter 4 of that book, the way he describes these people as persons who do not know their right hand from their left. is this, this tragic description of people that were so morally confused. That's the imagery there. And this boy, because of this demon, because of this spirit, couldn't even function as a human being. Now, it's one thing for pagans like the Ninevites to come to such a place. But for those who had dwelt on what had been God's holy mountain, it is utterly perverse. It is a perverse spirit. Of all the people to miss Jesus, you'd think the Jews would be like way down on that list. That they'd be at the top of the list of those who absolutely recognized him because their scriptures foretold him. Well, if that's the diagnosis, the spirit of that age... And what's the cure? And that's what the disciples were wondering. And the answer is that the cure is God's own power beyond this age. Now, if I say it like that, that's pretty obvious. Jesus walks in, and boom, he can do what nobody else can do. It's the obvious part that all Christians would agree to about this passage, that it is Christ alone who has the real power behind any healing, any restoration of body and soul. And so at the heart of the passage is verse 18, that Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Now, that's enough for many who read the passage. And to a certain extent, that's fine, because that'll mean when you pray for loved ones, when you have loved ones that are acting not much better than this child, maybe because they're at a certain age, or maybe because they've given themselves up to sin or to some error, some kind of blinding allegiance to something in this world, that you go to Christ. And that absolutely is the main application. But you have to remember that the disciples had a different question. And it's in the text for our benefit. You have to remember that the disciples had previously been given power to cast out demons. You remember that from Matthew 10, verse 1, when he sent out the disciples, he gives them power. And I, I can tell you right now, if I had previously been granted the same power, it seems like, that Jesus had, and everywhere you go, Jesus casts out demons, and when they are sent out, they cast out demons in the same way in his name, I'd probably want to know, too. I'd probably be more than a little curious myself. Why is it not, you know, I'd probably get superstitious about it. Why is the power not channeling as it was before? But to make matters worse, it wasn't just a curiosity for them. They were being surrounded by some very unsatisfied customers. They were starting to gather into a mob. 
So remember the scene here. If you put Matthew and Mark's gospel together, Jesus and the three disciples had just come down from the mountain. And it wasn't just some nebulous mountaintop experience like at Christian camp. This was the mountaintop experience. In a manner of speaking, they were returning from heaven down to earth. And what did they find but a twisted and faithless generation? It was a mixed crowd. Mark's gospel gives some more shading to the picture when it says in chapter 9, verse 14, that when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around him and scribes arguing with them. So the the scene is the disciples getting picked on by the same scribes that didn't mind accusing even Jesus. So it's a very important point to see. The rest of the disciples were waiting below. They were not in this mountaintop experience. They were not coming down from heaven. And when Jesus and these three disciples who were chosen to go up there had, found, had, had come down to those waiting below, they found themselves in a hostile environment. And so elsewhere, the question is posed by Jesus himself about another generation. In Luke 18, that when the Son of Man comes, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? The church can be a genuine church and yet find themselves in a faithless generation and be caught up in faithless norms. And just like Israel at Mount Sinai saying, hey, where's this Moses guy? Where is he gone? He and his God left us to to die down here. That was pretty much the complaint. So the church, so the disciples of Christ on earth who know nothing about anything besides this generation. Where's Jesus? Where'd the power go? Where's the promise? And so his basic answer to the disciples was this in verse 20. Because of your little faith. Because of your little faith. This is not a word of faith, name it and claim it, blab it and grab it text. It does get twisted out of context like so many others in the Gospels. Because of your little faith. Because even that answer is surfacing. It's the imagery that he adds that gives it all its meaning. Because this has been twisted so badly out of context by the Word of Faith movement. I remember one movie that's not worth mentioning. It's a stupid movie. But it's just one of many you could list of, of how Christians are made fun of. And, and this text comes up, somebody that had been converted, so he claimed to be converted to Christ. You see those all the time. And somebody's mocking him. And he says that, well, with Jesus, I have this faith that can move mountains. And this guy who's mocking him, one of his older friends, who's not a Christian, says, well, go ahead, move this mountain. All right, go ahead, let's start you off easy. Move this wall. And, and, he, and he, you know, he does this or whatever else he was superstitiously led to believe that these passages teach. And he couldn't. And he lost his faith. But that's out of context, obviously. He says in verse 20, Truly I say to you, this is the rest of his answer. You have little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, You will say to this mountain, by the way, notice he doesn't say, you will say to, you know, whatever mountain you, whatever mountains, whatever Goliaths, whatever giants are in your life to slay, whatever mountains, could be any mountain, Mount Kilimanjaro, if you've got one, a really big house, a really big problem in your life. None of that's happening here. This is a very specific mountain. that's That's a pretty important interpretive point. You will say to this mountain, move from here to there. And it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. So what's the true meaning of these words, if it's not just this name it and claim it type thing? Well, again, mustard seeds and mountains. We've run into them before, just like this generation. And Matthew's emphasis is consistently this with all of these words. The king is here. He will be rejected in this city on this mountain. But his kingdom is going to explode outward, like that mustard seed, remember, from chapter 13. That was the meaning of the mustard seed. It's going to expand and explode to the whole world. So what is this mountain getting moved? This generation. And we're going to see that increasingly in chapters 20, 21, and on. That the moving of this mountain, and it is literal, and God uses the armies of pagans to do it. And we will come to that. But why is this being brought up here? I, I just, he's just healing uh, this, this poor boy and his father. They're, they're, 
And I don't think they're bothered by it because now he's healed, so they're just rejoicing. But, but uh, the onlookers could say, well, what does this have to do with anything? But they, see, they're asking him this privately. Why would Jesus ordain that a boy has a demon driven out of him, be restored to his father and to normal life, and all this symbolize, what again, this generation? This generation is what he needs deliverance from, not just some private demon, not just even the terrible effects, and they are terrible in this life. And then finally, what seems random attached to this section is yet another exclamation point, seemingly random in verses 22 and 23. As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And he will be raised on the third day, and they were greatly distressed. Now, critical scholars look at this, and they get greatly distressed. They make whole careers out of losing their minds over things like this. Where does this come from? This is just randomly in the middle of nowhere. And our first question, our answer to that question is, it comes from Jesus. Jesus is increasingly bringing this up. Why does it need to be there? Why do the disciples need to be reminded? Because they need to be reminded. And we need to be reminded that the main thing, what is the main thing? Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, that the main thing is Jesus Christ dead, buried, and raised. The cross and the empty tomb. In other words, the gospel he calls of first importance. And it's of first importance even if you have a son who seems to have problems that seem to have everything to do in this world and you're going to try to fix it by worldly means and pray to God to help you fix it by earthly means, which is kind of what we do in most of our prayers. There's a much bigger problem here and a much bigger solution that Jesus would point us to when he's pointing us to himself. So let, let's apply this to a couple of things and maybe it can... Uh, it's a difficult passage. I mean, let's just be honest. It's a narrative, and at the center of it is, okay, he casts out a demon. I'll go to Jesus for all my biggest problems. And that, that's good. It's a good start. The rest of it is hard unless you really put it in the context of the rest of the gospel. But I think some practical application might help. The symptoms of this demon-possessed boy. This passage is here for our instruction. This raises the question about how demon possession might or might not be related to other causes of disorders in our souls. There's all sorts of controversies in the Christian community about, well, what's the, well, where's the boundary between psychology and demon possession, or meds and demon possession, or the causes of it, like depression and demon possession, or, or things like that. And what we tend to do, just like I brought up in the class today, is we tend to compartmentalize things. And we take the material things over here and the spiritual things over here, and maybe we have views that are only one and not the other. And we just draw a big wall between them as two totally different realities, as if God has nothing to do with all of them. And we do that. And this error pits one thing against another. And that has always, and even commentators do it as they come to the passage. They argue over the word whether epileptic should be used, or maybe they should use the older word lunatic. And at first, we, what do we hear when we hear that? Epileptic, I think medicine stuff. Lunatic, I hear the older thing we used to do with people before we knew better and stuff like that. And that's absolutely not true in the immediate, and it wasn't even true in the ancient world. In fact, the word lunatic just comes from the Latin word for moon. And in Jerome's uh, Vulgate, in the Latin, it's lunaticus. And it's still used in some English translations. But it's already there in the Greek word. The Greek word brought together the natural condition and the spiritual cause. And my point is not that I'm prescribing for you and I'm telling you that it's always demon possession or that it's half of the time or anything like that. I'm not suggesting anything like that. But it's just to correct something in our worldview. The practical point is to simply not develop that modern habit of compartmentalizing spiritual causes and physical causes as if they're two utterly different realities that don't have anything to do with each other. You know, this is practical again, practical and practical. One bad thing that happens when you do that is that you start to farm out things that the Bible would have you be involved in, in people's lives. And you either farm that out to secular psychologists, or you farm it out to the meds, or you farm it out to something else. Or you think that meds are always bad, because if I do that, then I'm farming it out. So in, from different sides, we start to have this fractured worldview. And we become superstitious on both sides. 
So, so this is, this, don't do that. It's not the way the Bible talks. Uh, secondly, this passage is for our admonition. Everything I just said about disorders to the soul applies also to intellectual responses to God's truth. When somebody's deconstructing. When somebody has a problem with the faith. This is always spiritual and moral and intellectual. It's never one versus the other. But every spirit of the age has one thing in common, aside from it being spiritual. It blinds those who are in it to anything outside of this time and this place. Remember Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 4 that the God of this world, namely the devil, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Which of them? 50%? Just the smart ones? Just the not smart ones? No. Any time you have resistance to Christ... You have the God of this world blinding the minds of unbelievers. I thought it was their own heart. It's that too. It's the power of darkness working in a soul that has given themselves up to demons. Can't see a thing, but inside of those mountains, like prison walls around the whole of one's reality, a matrix of the moment. We become faithless, not because there's ever good arguments against any of the objects of the Christian faith, but because we are content to get along with this generation. Oftentimes, people's falling away from the faith and asking, asking questions, supposedly, is really just a matter of compromise, accommodation, getting along with the things of this generation. So what's the takeaway? Always remember to mix with your arguments prayer. Prayer for the souls of those who we know are held captive by the devil and to not be unaware that that is what is going on. The more I talk to young people who are deconstructing, I always put that in air quotes, deconstructing in their faith, the more I know that I'm staring into the soul of someone who is under the spell of demonic powers. They are justifying their sin, and like this boy, they cannot even see that they are starting to act in a manner that everybody else around them recognizes as self-destructive. This is an extreme case, falling into fires, falling into water but it leads to self-destructive activity. So pray hard for them with your arguments. Both pray hard for them. And finally, there's gospel here. Here's that surface but true interpretation. Take them to Christ. Take them directly to Christ. Yes, God uses means. He used his disciples before to cast out demons. He uses his ministers in every age. But at the end of the day, only Christ's power from before all ages can break the spirit of this age. Take them to Christ in prayer. Take them to Christ in conversation. When they want to change the subject to all of our imperfections and hypocrisies and stuff, admit your own. But then change the subject right back to Jesus. But in all these things, this text is saying, take them to Christ. Let's pray. Father, we pray for that now, first and foremost. As we see in this boy, a, a picture of loved ones, perhaps children that have strayed from the faith, friends, others we've known. Those who have, from our perspective, grown up in what we used to call a Christian culture, maybe, and yet are all the more closed to these things because they think they've heard all that already. They've maybe received a, a dose of it that makes them impervious to the real thing. But we know that it is not impervious to the power of the Holy Spirit. So Lord, we pray that you would open up the eyes of the blind, that you would rescue those we know and love that are in captivity under some stronghold of the devil, where they cannot hear a thing, where they can only see this time and place as if it could last forever, Lord, please blast away that delusion and keep them not only from harming themselves in temporal ways, but rescue them from the one who has the power of death and who held the fear of death over us once but now no longer because of your forgiveness. Lord, help them to see that forgiveness in you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.